So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome those in person and also those joining us online to this sales lunchtime seminar that is going to be delivered by our speaker today, who is Dr. Magali Evan. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce her. She's a lecturer at the University of Glasgow and a rising star in the field of competition law. Those of you who are familiar with her uh, publications will know that she has published extensively a number of articles on issues that are cutting edge in the field of competition law, issues concerning market definition and also how antitrust law can be used to tackle new forms of anti-competitive uh, behavior. So today she's going to talk to us about something that is something that she's working now and she's in the course of preparing an exciting monograph which should see the uh, light of day before too long. And I don't know whether you have looked at her title, but it's a very provocative title, is the antitrust market does not exist. So why should we define one? Market definition, sense and nonsense in digital markets, which I think sounds incredibly exciting. So I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to listening to her talk today. And I'm going without any more further delay to leave the floor to her. So she's going to talk for about 45, 50 minutes, and then there will be a time for questions, both for those of you who are here and also for those who are joining us online. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Um, it's always interesting to hear other people explain who you are. Uh, so thank you so much for that. So what I want to start with is by saying, um, as already has been pointed out, a lot of this is work in progress. And I work on market definition. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is just questions about where we go from here. And so because I'm working on a book, anything you tell me, even to tell me I'm completely wrong would be great because then I can actually make the book good rather than just the talks I give. So any feedback, very much appreciated. So yes, I am going to talk about competition law and I'm gonna talk about market definition in particular and digital market, but I'm really gonna ask questions about concepts and whether they're as good or as relevant as we think about them. Um, and um, so I would like to challenge myself and challenge you. And I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So what is the problem? Well, as I already said, I am working on market definition and I've written a couple of articles. Some articles with people like uh, Professor Vicky Robertson about why market definition is challenging in digital markets specifically, those are methodological questions. I've also written a paper entitled The Antitrust Market Does Not Exist. And that's a conceptual question. So is there such a thing as a market? Why do we define a market in competition? I am currently working on a book and in that book, I'm talking about market definition in digital markets. And I'm trying to combine those questions kind of, of well, what are the methodological challenges? And what are we doing conceptually about market definition? And because I'm working on the book, I've started thinking about market definition in a lot more depth than I ever did before, despite the fact that I wrote a whole PhD thesis on it. I have now actually started thinking about it properly. And it really struck me that this is an area of competition law that is routine, but also controversial. And there are challenges to using market definition in competition law. And I want to touch on these challenges in this talk. And then I wanna ask you, so what do we do about these challenges? And in order to really address these challenges, I think we need to have a concrete question. Is market definition useful? What is a market? Why are we using something entirely fictitious in economics and in law to underpin our reasoning? And I want to do that with you today and kind of start talking about what the answers are to some of the challenges in our field. Now, for those of you who are in the room, how many of you know competition law and what market definition is? Put your hand up if you have an idea. Okay, great. That means I don't have to do a market definition exercise with you. Um, with my students, we usually use chocolate and I put them in little groups and I make them define the market for chocolate. I thought I would uh, change it and define the market for Coca-Cola. 
but it makes it a lot easier if I don't have to do that. But concretely, what do we do when we define a marketing competitional? Well, we start from the perspective of one particular company, usually the one under investigation. We identify the product that it sells, and then we add other products based on substitutability analysis. In practice, we're basically drawing a line around all those products, around all those companies who competitively constrain each other. And once we've drawn the line, that's it. That's what we focus our analysis on in a competition law case. That means we're really drawing lines where in practice, there aren't such concrete lines in nature. And we do this because it allows us to answer certain questions. Now, you do that most of the time based on consumer desire, on demand substitutability, to come to all the products they consider substitutes. That's the process of market definition as we know it, but arguably it's not always been the way we did market definition. And so this is just a methodology that we've adopted now. And I think that's an important thing to think about as we go through this, this talk, but the methodology isn't necessarily set in stone. Okay, so I think there are three categories of challenges to market definition. The first is, I think the most known one, which is that there are people, particularly in the United States, who argue we should get rid of market definition altogether. They say there are alternatives to market definition that are better. There are direct ways of assessing market power, and therefore we shouldn't use market definition, which is a best guess of the market and a best guess of market shares. There's even people who say that defining a market is counterproductive and would lead to the wrong answers when it comes to market power. Now, there are two really famous pieces here, and I think the most famous of all is by Kaplow, um, who says, why ever define markets? And Matkovitz says that market definition is entirely arbitrary. But what is interesting about these arguments is that they focus on market definition as a way to define the market so that you can allocate market shares to companies and use that as a proxy for establishing market power. I'm going to argue that that's not the only reason we define the market. Market power is not the only function of market definition and arguably it's the least important one, okay? So this first group of criticism of market definition is arguably very accurate, but doesn't give us a full picture. The second group of challenges is a challenge I worked on in my PhD thesis and I've still been working on. And that's to say that the tools that we employ to define markets are based on characteristics of markets as they existed before digital markets. So our tools are based, for example, on, on prices, the existence of monetary prices. Now, if you have particular services that are offered for free or in exchange for personal data, maybe, there is still the problem that you have no monetary price. So if your tests for defining markets are based on price, then you're kind of stuck. Similar arguments um, occur because platforms and digital markets have more than one customer group, more than one side. How do you incorporate that? And a third big category of methodological challenges in digital markets is that of ecosystems. The idea that there are multiple companies, multiple products, multiple services, that are part of a larger network and how do you define a market for that? Now, I'm not actually going to make a talk or present a talk based on these three elements. Because to me, fundamentally, these are the least important discussions we are currently having, okay? So zero pricing, ecosystems, multi-sided platforms, the things I've dedicated my last few years on, probably not that important, yeah? And because they are, Methodological challenges, all they require us to do is come up with different methods. Now, obviously that's important. It's an important step for us to take, but I think it's not a fundamental issue. I am working on trying to figure out better methods, but that's just better methods. The thing that I think is more interesting is the last group of criticisms of market definition. And I think this is where the future lies, which is, where you have people saying we should forego formal market definition. Formal market definition. Now, the emphasis is not on foregoing market definition in general, 
but the formal versions of market definition. And this is where I'm starting to try to kind of come up with a, a, an idea of what exactly is meant by this. And so to paint the picture, this is usually in digital markets, this discussion, but I think it can be extrapolated to a more general discussion. These are people, mostly enforcers, regulators, who say that market definition as a first step in an investigation is too burdensome. It takes too long. It is too complicated. And it ends up giving us a result that is binary and static. That tells us that certain companies are in the market and all the rest are out of the market. That that doesn't represent reality. Okay. And therefore, we should let go of formal market definition. The wording here is always a bit interesting. So the impact assessment study for the Digital um, Markets Act in the EU talks about abandoning formal market definition, as does the discussion, the documents for the UK digital regulation regime, the pro-competition regime. They also talk about abandoning formal market definition. And they say things like, well, with formal market definition, you end up with a binary outcome that can be subject to judicial review. Because we know what the methods are, we know you need to have an in-out answer, therefore a court can check whether that has been done. We don't really want that. With formal market definition, you have all these guidelines and all this, these steps that need to be taken, and that is just too long and too complex. But they do actually do market definition. So if you look at the digital regulation as proposed in the UK, the UK's suggested regime says we're going to identify activities. How do you identify activities? By looking at all the products, all the services that satisfy the same desire. That is market definition. It is the same concept as we see in competition law, but just formulated differently. So what is the difference then? What does it mean that we're abandoning formal market definition? Does it mean that we are not drawing hard boundaries? Does it mean that we're not accepting binary conclusions? Does it mean that we have no judicial review? And that is where I think we need to ask some serious questions. Is that what we want? Now, I don't yet have an answer to that, but I think there are some things we need to discuss in order to come to an answer about why we may or may not want to keep formal market definition. The first step here is to just accept the reality which I think we sometimes struggle to do, which is that we're working with something that is entirely fictitious. Have you ever stepped into a market? There is no such thing as a market. A market is a fiction. It's an economic fiction. It's a legal fiction. It's something we use to make our analysis easier to understand. So when we're discussing what the boundaries of the market are and how formal we need to be, I think we should all just take a step back and accept we're talking about something that does not exist in reality, okay? And we often do that as lawyers. We like working with legal fictions. It's our bread and butter, but we need to accept that's what we're working with. And I think sometimes we lose sight of this fact. So the market does not exist. I, um, when I was writing my article called The Antitrust Market Does Not Exist, basically started writing it because I was lying awake multiple nights. And so I turned on an audiobook by Carlo Rovelli called The Order of Time, which has nothing to do with law whatsoever, okay? It's about time, you know, physics, some chemistry, nothing about law. But I heard him say this, and I kept going back to this particular quote because I thought, oh, I should really write a paper and apply this idea to market definition. Because what did Carlo Rovelli say? Well, he said, what we do is that by trying to understand the world, just the physical world, we take things and we apply labels to it, we group things together that are not grouped together in reality. In his example, he was talking about Mont Blanc. I was saying, you know, we, we choose rock formations and we take a few rock formations that look kind of nice. Like we look at the clouds and we see an animal. Well, we see rocks and we put them together 
and we give them a name and we say they are a unit. Mont Blanc is just a unit of rock formations that we have chosen to see as a whole, as an entity. But we could have chosen a different way of structuring the world and grouping it. The fact that we chose this is our human choice and we did it so we could talk about Mont Blanc. So if my partner who likes to walk, uh, walk, watch rock climbers, when he says, oh, they're climbing Mount Everest, well, he can talk about it because we've decided to call that Mount Everest as opposed to this particular rock at these degrees, okay? We do the same thing when you talk about market definition. We're basically choosing which economic interactions we find interesting, grouping them together, calling it a market, and excluding everything else. Now, we lawyers didn't start this, the economists did. And I think it's really interesting to think back about where our relevant market concept comes from, look back at the economist who started it. Now, in economics, the market is obviously very important. And although there is kind of an agreement on what that means, you kind of use the market to talk about consumption and production occurrences that happen through a form of exchange. What is actually meant when economists talk about the market really depends on their field of study, their subfield of study and the question they are trying to answer. For example, if you're trying to figure out how pricing works, you might take Cournot's definition of a market as an area in which buyers and sellers are in such free intercourse that the prices tend to equality. That's one view of the market. Another definition of the market that Alfred Marshall used was that you put different companies together because the interactions between those companies are considered more important to understand competition. And so this brings us a bit closer to antitrust law. The example, this photo that is here on the slide, I think is really nice because it's um, the utility machine by Irving Fisher. Now Irving Fisher, I think in the 1890s was doing a PhD in Yale and he decided, I don't know if he actually built it himself, but he decided that we needed you know, a visual representation of the economy and he created the utility machine in which different pumps and levers are used to move fluids about. And those fluids represent prices moving towards an equilibrium, but never moving outside of the box, moving only within the box. And that box is our market. There is nothing in this utility machine outside of the box. The economy is all encapsulated in these pumps and levers. Now, that's obviously not realistic. There was more outside of the box. But in order to represent his ideas, he created this machine in which fluids stay neatly within these boundaries. And when Alfred Marshall talked about his partial equilibrium, which became the foundation for most of our analyses, he said the same thing. He said, okay, I'm only gonna look at these relationships between these companies that I have put in this market, because I'm going to assume as a working hypothesis that every market that falls out of, every company that falls out of these boundaries is irrelevant, irrelevant for my analysis. Now, that was a working assumption. And he said very clearly that he knew this wasn't real, but that that's what you needed to do to make any kind of economic analysis manageable. Industrial organization economists built on this, Mason, Bain, Stigler, in order to help their own analysis, but they also eventually gave birth to our relevant market concept by saying that they would start from the position of a single seller and try to see which other sellers and also which buyers influenced the commercial decision-making of that single seller. Only those that had a significant impact on its decision-making would be in the market, okay? And Fritz Macklop, um, described this, the work of his fellow economists. And he said, well, obviously it's only a tool. It's an abstraction of reality, but it's what we need to do to come to any meaningful answers. 
He made it very specific that the boundaries you choose depend on the question you are asking. Now, why is this relevant for us? Because sometimes people portray this discussion of market definition as a clash between economists and lawyers, where the economists are telling us we're doing something ridiculous and irrealistic. Well, the economists started it. The economists told us there is no such thing as a market, but roll with it, okay? We need it for our analysis. And we lowly lawyers just followed their example. Now, this started in America, as many of these discussions on competition law do. It started in the US where the Sherman Act and also later the Clayman Act section seven talks about commerce, lines of commerce, and gave us a basis on which to work and eventually gave us a basis for the relevant market concept. Now, in the EU, the EU competition law came a lot later. So evidently, when you start as a relatively new jurisdiction to develop a field of law that exists somewhere else, you tend to look at that somewhere else. So we tended to look at America. And this is important because where this concept starts in the US, we eventually copy it here with our own kind of spin on it. But I think this is important for us because it means that any discussions that happen in America should be looked at when we're conceptually talking about the market. Now, you have at the very start of the case law in the US, this recognition that you need to define lines of commerce. You need to kind of know which range of products, which markets you're looking at, but the boundaries are selective and therefore not set in stone. And in the early cases, so in Standard Oil, American Tobacco, 1911, you see references to product ranges like uh, chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco and petroleum products, but there's no such thing as a very strict delineation of the market. This over time evolves. In the 1930s, there's a bit more discussion about wha what the relevant scope is of a market how you draw these hard boundaries, but it's still kind of in its infancy. It isn't until the 1940s, 1950s, that judicial scrutiny of markets intensifies. It's also around this time that you see a lot of emphasis on market definition for the assessment of market power. There's the famous Alcoa case in the US, where there's discussions about the level of market shares that indicates market power. Obviously, to know what share of a market a company has, you need to have defined the market. In 1948, there is a case, Columbia Steel, where the court says that the government's alleged market is too narrowly defined. That the area of effective competition, the constraints on the companies is much broader, much wider than has been put forward by the government. We still don't have a proper methodology but there's already a recognition that if we want to do this analysis properly, we need to draw boundaries. In 1950s, in the Times Picayune case, you see more methodology, more discussion of cross elasticity of demand and things like that. So you see an evolution where there's from the start a recognition that you need something as a market, but where the boundaries lay isn't very clear. This evolves. You get the 1968 merger guidelines in the US. They go a bit further in defining the market, but it isn't really until the 1980s merger guidelines that you get a methodology worked through. Now, I think these guidelines are incredibly important for our discussion because they set out a methodology, but that methodology is interesting because it focuses on market power. So, in the guidelines, the idea is that you go back to industrial organization. Economists' idea of starting from the position of a single seller, right? So you choose a particular product, the product of the firm under investigation, and that's your candidate market. It's your first step, and you add more products to it with every step of the way. What I think is fascinating about this subsequence that was also called an algorithm before algorithms were cool. What's interesting about the sequence is that the way you determine how to add products to the market is by looking at the area that a hypothetical monopolist could monopolize. Now, the methodology here 
is really focused on market power. The question of market definition is from this moment on intrinsically linked to the ability to increase or exercise your market power. And that's quite crucial in our analysis. From then on, our focus of market definition is market power. When this makes it to the EU in the 1950s, actually most of the discussions about market definition start in abuse of dominance cases. So it's a bit controversial what I'm saying because the first abuse of dominance case is actually a merger case. But theoretically, if you just look at the legal basis purely and simply market definition is created for abuse of dominance. That's how it starts here. And that's quite interesting considering that the methodology of market definition in the US is merger guidelines, right? Already there's a bit of a tension here. So we're using methodology for seeing whether a merger could in the future increase market power to see whether there is market power. Those are not necessarily the same questions, but that's what we do. So in the 1950s, the very first case under the European Economic Community Treaty and that's a side note, there was also the coal and steel community, they had competition provisions, but I'm going to be blatant and just ignore those for a second. Under our proper competition law, since 1957, right? Under those in abuse of dominance cases from the very first case, the court says, you need market definition. You cannot bring cases without market definition. You can't assess anti-competitive effects without the market. You can't assess anything. The market is the legitimizing force of competition, also you need it. Do we have proper methodology? Not really. We just know we need it, but not quite how to get there. So as we move through time, we see more and more methodology. There is a famous case that we look back at with disdain, the United Brands case, because the result there was ridiculous. You know, bananas is their own market, because if you don't have tea, you can't eat anything but bananas. From modern point of view, that's a ridiculous result. But at the time, that was quite a big step forward. This idea of focusing on consumer desire and substitutability, that's not something we really had before then. So it's always easy for us to look back and mock people, but actually at the time that was quite clever. Not so clever because obviously we stole it from America. Yeah. Now, we get methodology developing in the 50s, in the 60s. One. When we finally get a merger regulation in the 1980s, it is evidence we're going to have market definition. We're used to it. And moreover, the merger guidelines in the US exist by that time, and we can copy it. It isn't until 1997 that we get a proper guideline of our own, the market definition notice. Okay. What are the key points to remember? Well, the evolution was gradual, but from the very start, we said market definition was essential. This focus on market power was there, but linking the methodology of market definition to market power was a choice. It was a choice. It wasn't a necessity. So what do you do when you define a market? Well, let's leave methodology to a side for a second. You are focusing on a reality and blurring out everything else. You're focusing on a group of products, a group of companies, and assuming that everything that exists outside of that group is irrelevant for your analysis, okay? You could do that either because you're trying to identify market shares and therefore identify market power, but that's not the only reason you would do it. First, you do it because you want to know who you care about. You want to identify the companies who you have to interrogate, who you have to ask for evidence. If you didn't do it, then who would you focus on? Who would you downrate? Who would you survey? Who would you consider in your analysis? And beyond that, the relationships between these companies, you can't look at every single relationship between every consumer, every seller in the whole economy. You have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. Even if we didn't have market definition, we'd have market definition because we'd be selecting which companies to focus on. But that's a general point. Second point is that you then can use market definition to establish market shares and you have an indirect way of establishing market power. Arguably though, 
there are other ways of establishing market power. From a very early stage, we knew with the discussions of Abba Lerner, we knew you could calculate market power directly if you had enough information, if you knew this hypothetical idea of marginal cost, for example, because pricing above marginal cost gives us an indication of market power. Is it perfect? No. But is market definition perfect? Absolutely not. So we could theoretically devise alternatives to find market power. But you would still need market definition because you can't engage in an analysis of the harm to competition without it. A antitrust case requires you to identify not just the relationships between companies and consumers that are being affected, but more broadly, the harm to the market. What is the difference between an unfair competition case and a competition law case? The market is the difference. And when you have those criticisms of um, the European Commission supposedly protecting competitors rather than competition, as abstract and sometimes totally unnecessary as a criticism as that is, it points to the idea that there is something larger than just the individuals. We're protecting something beyond those actors. But what's the market? How are you supposed to analyze whether the market is harmed if you don't know what the market is? Okay. So that's the legitimizing force of competition law. It's also practically necessary because otherwise you can't do any proper effects analysis. And the European case law and the US case law says this. So just a couple examples of cases. I think in 1967, we had the Court of Justice in Brasserie de Haagd saying market definition is necessary for the effects analysis. Without it, we can't assess effects. In Article 101 cases, which arguably are less above market power than Article 102 cases, there was a debate about the position of market definition for a long, long time. And what was the debate about? Whether you needed market definition for by object cases, because, as it was said, in by effect cases on C, you need to define the market because you need to know where the effects are being anal analyzed. It's in by object cases that we might not need it. What does that tell us? Market definition is necessary for effect analysis. In Erste Bank, Siegler, advocate generals have said market definition is necessary for effect analysis. Also in the US. So, Brown Shoe case. Um, the Walker process equipment case, um, or the most recent one, the American Express Supreme Court case, all of them affirm the position of market definition in the effects analysis. When I published my uh, article, the antitrust market doesn't exist, someone sent me an email and said, have you seen the amicus brief by the Federal Trade Commission in the Gilead case? I said, no, I haven't. I probably should have seen it, but it wasn't in my article. What is he this brief about? The Federal Trade Commission is explaining we need market definition for the effects analysis. Brilliant. Why do we keep talking about market power? Why is all our focus on getting rid of market definition? Because it doesn't help us assess market power. You'd still need market definition for the effects analysis. Now, just want to make a side note. So I've just told you that difference between competitional and unfair competition law is harm to the market. In a totally, well, what I thought was a totally unrelated research project with my friend and colleague Orbrook, who will be here in a few days, we've been looking at German and French national cases because we're trying to evaluate Article 3 of Regulation 1 2003, which is fascinating, but totally unrelated to this. And I've come to the conclusion that it's not that clear where the market is the dividing line between unfair competition law and competition law in practice. But I'm going to keep rolling with that because that is what it should be. Whether the practice of the courts reflects that is another matter. So I just want to, for intellectual honesty, tell you that there is a sign out here. But we need a dividing line, right, between unfair practices and competition law. And I think the dividing line is the market. So I started this by giving you Three, three main challenges. First, remember market power 
can be assessed directly, so you don't need market definition. That was the first one. I think we can all agree that that's ludicrous. Yeah. As brilliant as scholars, as capitalist market goods are, they're missing a fundamental piece of the puzzle, which is market definition, is for market power by choice. We design our methodology to focus on market power by choice, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be that way because you need the market for other things as well. So even if you got rid of market shares, even if you got rid of market power or you assess it directly, it wouldn't solve the problem. But we need to be honest and say it's possible. So for most of the time, most of our laws do not require market definition. They require market power in their statutes. And where we use market shares, it's usually because it's a convenient tool to do so. So we could get rid of market definition in that context, but it would still leave us with the other questions. And the other questions are formal market definition, right? This idea that we need to get rid of formal market definition and the methodology in digital markets. Now, the methodology in digital markets is currently our focal point. Everybody, me included, is looking at that. And that's obvious why, because it's difficult to bring our current cases, because we don't actually know how to deal with zero prices. We don't know how to deal with multi set of platforms. We don't know how to deal with ecosystems. As time evolves, though, um, you see that there's an evolution. We're starting, but we kind of have come up with answers for the zero price problem. We're starting to converge on methodology for multi sided platforms. And for ecosystems, we're not quite sure, but don't worry, we're going to solve it. That's what my book is supposed to do, right? My argument in general is that ecosystems is just another word for a market. An ecosystem is just a market in the sense that you're identifying which products and companies to include. So it's, we can solve that. Methodology, as important as it is in our discussion, is actually not that hard because we have chosen methodology earlier on, we could have chosen other methods. So it's a choice we make and it's trying to work with economists to find solutions which lawyers and judges can implement. And it's the last part that maybe is a bit tricky, okay, but that we can solve. I think a more fundamental question is this challenge that we need to get rid of formal market definition. Well, what does that mean concretely? Why are we trying to get rid of formal market definition? We're trying to get formal market definition out of the way because we don't like judicial review. In that case, I would strongly say, as lawyers, we should be concerned. And I think this about digital regulation in general. We should be concerned. Oh, maybe for convenience sake, we don't want judicial review. Okay. Are we trying to get rid of formal market definition? Because we don't like the static binary nature of it. We don't like the ins and outs. It's a valid concern. The idea that if you are choosing to focus your analysis on particular products and particular companies, well, you're excluding other things. And that in dynamic markets characterized by innovation, that's problematic. My counter argument is, what are we including everything? How are you supposed to bring a case if you don't know what to focus? And when I see the proposals that have been made, for example, in the DMU in the UK, they've just reinvented market definition. So I don't actually see how this is better than what we currently have. They're proposing something that is pretty much identical with a different name, activities. They even use the word substitute. So what are they trying to do? There is merit in this conversation about the binary and static nature of the market. It is a useful thing. It is us grouping the reality in a manageable little section, but it is useful to ask, well, why are we choosing to include those things and not other things? Are we excluding things in the assessment? And we should focus on that question. How are we making those hard boundaries? Why are we excluding certain things? Rather than saying that in and out is bad. In fact, if you look at the practice of the European Commission, it often leaves markets open. It will define multiple relevant markets and say that if their effects analysis would be the same 
and not significantly change depending on which market they choose, they will leave it open. It's not something we are unfamiliar with. But it's possible to have a static approach to market definition and still, still have a more open-ending analysis. The last thing I want to talk about is about this formal market definition in a per se by object world. I think this is where the interesting thing happens. This is where I think the argument that we should abandon formal market definition makes sense. It makes sense if there's no effects analysis that you don't need to define the market with a big caveat. Only if what we care about isn't in market. Okay. So if you look at the current digital regulation in the EU, they are proposing to protect competition, but also protect fairness. And if the contestability angle of digital regulation, the market angle of digital regulation is what they're going to use to go after companies, then even if they don't define a market, harm to the market is implicit in their reasoning. They will be talking about a market in some sense, whether or not that is formally defined. And that's why they talk about, you know, these core platform services. Again, that's the first step of market definition. So fine, you can have per se, you can have by object rules. You don't need to define a market, but it is there. But when you talk about fairness, you are no longer talking about the market. You are talking about individual companies that you are trying to protect. And that's a valid decision. But it doesn't need the market, you can abandon market definition. If you take that logic to its ultimate conclusion, though, we arrive at something that is no longer about market definition, but about what are we actually doing with digital regulation, because we're trying to protect the market and individual participants all at the same time. That's for more clever people than I to figure out. So have I given you many answers? I think I've given you more questions than answers. I would say that once my book is written, you can all buy it, right? And give me that really, really low royalty that will definitely allow me to buy a house. And hopefully I will then have answered them. Um, but I think in summary, we don't talk about the actual fundamentals enough. And we just try to improve things and without talking about the fundamentals and in the process, we might think, make things worse than they actually are. All right, I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you.